remastered the original Tron digitally it was like I died and went to heaven you know suddenly I had all this capability to tweak the colors and mm, the exposures mm. it was it was one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me 30 years later you get to fix all these things and uh, the to see what they can do now in the beginning, it was like, okay, we're going to be able to do this, no problem. We're, this is with all this power. And then what's inevitable is people spend 105% of their 100%. And they're right, they're working overtime right now saying, yes. oh my God, we bit off more than we can chew. Well, that's the nature of the technical it, it, biz, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, it's funny to see that curve repeat. But uh, they want to make things real they have a deep desire as a whole I think it's a generational desire to to make this technology you know something that you can implement and it's interesting to see that that wheel go that way it's 3d and it's not 3D, what's it what to see the 3D applied to an unreal world yeah you know, and and such a unique visual world to see the light cycles and the grids and the skies, the solar sailor and these things in 3D. It's it's amazing. It's yeah, really. really cool. I I mean, Cameron's obviously got us all excited about 3D and yeah, yeah. And we're at a point where each new film that comes out in 3D teaches us something about that yeah. process in interesting ways. And it's almost back where you were. Pushing with the, the, the digital yeah, yeah. effects at the time. I think working. 3D is really interesting in Tron because it's such an architectural space. And the, uh, you know, th for a long time people got away in the world of 2D filmmaking by selling the illusion of three dimensional space through textures. So if you put enough greebies on a spaceship, it looked like it was, you know, really yeah. there. And, and with 3D, you really can't cheat that easily in terms of just putting down miscellaneous textures as information that, I have a theory that part of special effects is to just get past the ability of the mind to decipher. And then they go, oh, I'm overwhelmed, it must be good. And to see that linear space in Tron with that vanish point, vanishing point in the distance, it's so clear. It compared to a you know a, a more baroque or textured environment yeah. that you get an enormous sense of space right away graphically you know it, it's it's interesting yeah the because um, there's something interesting about representing flatness in 3D yeah yeah you know I mean yeah, Car it, Caroline did a little Caroline did a little of that mm -hmm. the, the Neil Gaiman origami's out you know yeah. into three space the 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 character, one of the inter I can tell you a little bit about the story, which is that Flynn's program clue from the original film is involved, and, and Jeff plays two roles, and, and Clue gets away from him. And, uh, you know, there's a whole familial aspect that there's a rivalry between Flynn's program and his real world son. And, you know, it's good Hollywood storytelling. I didn't write the script. But there's an interesting cyber aspect to it, which is um, that Clue, being a program, has a lockdown, you know, locked attitude about what has to get done. And he can't evolve. He can't change. And I think that, that 
when they wrote the script, they weren't really that aware of how big a problem that actually is in the world mm. of computers. Mm. They just, you know, people gravitate to that idea that a computer just is rigid, but people don't realize how many systems are locked that we wish we could change, you know, because this is the way the internet was built and this is yeah. the way, yeah. you know, you know, things are done and we're going to try to make the best of it, but we can't change the original software. So he's the, the human, uh, the cyber human, uh, program human, that's the equivalent of that problem. Interesting. And, and he's Jeff as a fully cyber entity. It, the strangest thing was that scene in the original film where we scan Jeff Bridges and he ends up on the game grid, mm. we just made that up. I mean, we had to get this character into cyberspace. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, what can we do? You know, Star Trek beams people down and does, you know, and, and I think at some point I talked to Marvin Minsky at MIT, you know, about this stuff. And, and it, it, you know, we came up with this laser scanning and we never thought it was going to be real, and then on the new film, we bring in Jeff and we scan him with a laser, <laughs> and there he and there is, is yes. on the game grid in real time. And it, you know, and I said to people, you know, this is crazy. You realize that, you, and they said, why? And I said, because, you know, it's like it was in the film. And they, just, that's the the point when they say, well, of course. And you know, that's when you really freak when you realize that you can. If you finally prophesize the future correctly, people go, well, that was inevitable. You know, it's like yeah, you really yeah. didn't do anything. Yeah, you totally get no credit. For, <laughs> yeah, right. You know. You just designed the world we now live in. And, uh, right, but yeah, you know, of course it went this way. You knew it was going to go this way. Well, actually, we didn't know it was going to go this way. Yeah, I think that's a confusion about predicting the future in science fiction. It doesn't predict the future, it makes the future. Yeah. Because the design experiments get embedded in the imagination of the next generation of engineers, scientists, designers, mm -hmm. and they begin to build things because they want to build the holodeck or they want to build... Right. It's a form of lock-in. They're already programmed to go in that direction.